but hey, it is good to see you, or at least good for you to see me, I guess. So uh, this is great. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about this, having it being my very first time doing it just in screen. So hang with me, please. Um, understand our heart as we're doing this uh, with the coronavirus or the COVID-19 um, issue. It is not based our decision on those who are healthy, but on those that are most vulnerable. And we know that if we do this and accidentally expose someone, our heart would be broken to know that we pass that along to someone. And so we are taking extra precautions um, and we appreciate you understanding um, that our love for each other and lifting each other up is uh, to protect the flock. And so please be with us as we get on. I'd like to invite you to pray with me as we jump into Nehemiah chapter 10 and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity today to get into your word. We have been blessed to study the book of Nehemiah, and we ask, Lord, as we open to Nehemiah 10 today, that you would work in our hearts. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for an opportunity to experience you wherever we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Nehemiah 10. I don't need to tell you it's on the Pew Bible on page 766, unless you took one home. And so in that case, I guess you'd have one at home. Um, but let's start this way. In 2011, our family went to Washington, D.C., and uh, we decided to go and experience uh, all that is in D.C. And, and check into our history. And it was real exciting to go to look at the different museums. And we went to the National Archive U Museum, where Thankfully, the Declaration of Independence had been returned from Nicolas Cage. You know, he stole it national treasure. And so the Declaration of Independence is a distinctive document for us. Many people know about three of our documents in the United States, one being the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and our Constitution. All three are housed in this one location. And when you go to the National Archives Museum, it's interesting because seeing these old, old documents that really kind of shape who we are as a nation, and in reading them, there's a statement in the Declaration of Independence that we find a summary sentence that says this, and for the support of this declaration, we, with a firm reliance on the protective, the protection of the divine Providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Our sacred honor. That's a unique creed. It's a unique creed for all of us. The signers believed that there was something special in this document, something special that God would see them through in the creation of this new nation, that something new was happening and that they were pledging mutually to one another their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Their honor in believing in something very important. What kind of men were these, if you think about it? 24 of them were either attorneys or judici judiciaries. So, or then 11 of them were merchants or businessmen. Nine of them were farmers or large plantation owners, and so they were all well-educated. They were all men of means, and they were putting their life on the lines when they signed this document. And they do it, did it well knowing that the penalty for signing this could be death. And so they were all in. They were all in signing this document. There were five of them that were actually captured by the British, and they were, they were treated as traitors. They were tortured, and they were killed for signing this, for what they believed was right. Twelve of them had their homes ransacked and burned. Two of them lost sons in the Revolutionary War, um, and another had two sons were captured. And so they put a lot of their own life in for our country, signing a document and saying, I'm all in. We're all in. For this. Of the not nine of the 56 of those who signed died from wounds from the wars that they were a part of in the Revolutionary War. And most of them, they either lost their homes, they lost family, they lost quite a bit because they signed the Declaration of Independence. Now they pledged their lives, they pledged their fortune, they pledged their sacred honor. When we come to Nehemiah chapter 10, we find another group. In fact, not 56, but 84, who will sign their lives to a document because they believe that God's going to do something new, and they're going to pledge their honor. 
They're going to want to pledge their honor to God to see God work in them. You see, when the wall was built in Nehemiah, we think that's the big accomplishment. There was something more happening. It was happening in the lives of the people, happening in the lives of, of, of each individual, of drawing them to God. When they, the wall is completed and they begin to be called back to God, they say to Nehemiah in chapter 8, they say, read us the book, read us, bring us the books or bring us the scrolls. Let's read us the, 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 the law. We want to know what it says. And so they read it and they respond to it. They celebrate Sukkot. They celebrate the, the, te- the, 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 the festivals of the booths. And then they come back and they're mourning. Now they're mourning where they've been and, and they're crying out to God. So chapter 9 is this beautiful prayer of Ezra for the people calling on God and crying out to God, uh, in, in essence saying, Lord, you're right, you're just in what you've done. And now in Nehemiah chapter 10, they're saying, Lord, we're all in. We are committed to honoring you and following what you have for our lives. And so if you'd look with me to Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 1, and actually I'd like you to back up one verse to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 38, where it says this, in view of all this, in view of the large prayer that they just read, that they just that we just read, that they just spoke, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, our priests are affixing their seals to it. What we're seeing here, and this is your first bullet if you're if you're paying attention this morning, is that, that they study the Bible. And that studying the Bible leads to worship, and studying the Bible leads to prayer, and then pouring out their lives to God. And then it leads to a public proclamation of dependence on God. Not independence, but dependence. And not only that, but they have a new conviction to have a covenant with God. Lord, we're making a promise. We're making a covenant to you today. And so in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 3, the leaders, the Levites, they're standing and they're making this declaration of dependence on the Lord. Warren Wearsby puts it this way. He says, it's one thing to offer the Lord a passionate prayer of confession, such as we have in chapter 9, and quite something else to live an obedient life after we say amen. But the people in the assembly were serious about their praying and were determined by God's grace to make a new beginning and live to please the Lord. Amen. I want to live to please the Lord, and I think you do too. And so what's happening here is all God's people are saying, we're in. Amen. All in. We're ready to do this. And are you all in? And if you're all in, I want you to see how they want to honor God in their commitment. So the first thing we see in the Lord, in their honoring the Lord, is a public covenant. A public covenant. Look at Nehemiah 1. It says, those who sealed it were Nehemiah, the governor, and Hakaliah, a son of Hakaliah, and Zedekiah. Now, there are 84 names. I'm not going to read them all. I'm not as good at reading these names as Pastor Nate is. And so I'll just let him read that sometime. But what you'll notice in these 84 names listed here is they're listed to show the unity within the community. There is a unity with all of them. We're all signing. We're all in on this. It's not just a few of them. It's not the 10 or 12 leaders. It's the whole community coming together. These are fathers. These are grandfathers. These are, these are leaders and husbands saying, our families are in. I represent my family. We represent our community. We are all in it. And there's an emphasis then on unity and community in this. Not like in chapter 5 when they were arguing, not like earlier on when they were excited just about building the wall, their own section of the wall, but now they are all coming together. The leadership has come together, the people have come together, they have celebrated together, and now they are covenanting together, together as a people and with God. So let's look at the public covenant. We find it in chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. It says, the rest of the people... Priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring people, here's the reason, for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who were able to understand all these joined together, that's unity, joining together their brothers and nobles, binding themselves, here's the covenant, binding themselves with a curse and an oath. That's a little bit scary, a curse, right? And an oath. To follow, here's the covenant, to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord, our Lord. Have you ever been to a wedding? 
Um, I, and I've done some weddings, and it's kind of fun when you do a wedding. You know there's kind of a particular point in the ceremony where we, we say our vows, where you know, the, the, the minister will say to the bride and to the groom, or usually to the groom and then the bride. We ask the man to go first, right, because he's supposed to be a leader. And we say to them, would you, you know, do you take this woman to be your lawfully married? You know, and you say these words, and they repeat, and they promise. They promise in richer and poor. Well, maybe until debt do us part, right? Okay, and death do us part. Okay, and all the different things that we experience. And then at, the, at a certain point, I'll say these words. Now that they've given themselves to each other by solemn vows before us and before God as witness, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, recognized by the state of Washington, I declare that this guy and this girl are man and wife. Those whom God have joined together, let no one separate. They've made a public proclamation. They have made a public promise, a covenant before and with God, before God and with God in the sense that they make that promise to each other, but it's with God. I'm saying, Lord, I'm making this publicly. Why do we do it publicly? Because after the ceremony, there has to be a promise. There's been a witness, right? And so we gather them together and they sign on the dotted line on the license. And then the witness comes and says, they saw this happen. So there's two witnesses that sign. There's been a witness, right? It's public. There's more accountability when we go public. In every commitment we make, when we go public with that commitment, there's more accountability. And so, so when you look, uh, but you wonder yourself, well, why did they want to make this public com com covenant? Why did they want to even do this? I think it's because they were reading the Bible. They were reading the Pentateuch. If you turn in your Bibles, I'll give you a minute to do this, or you can hit pause. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 10. So Deuteronomy, the last of the five books of the Pentateuch, they have read all the first five. They have, they're getting to this last part of the book. They're at verse chapter 29. There's only 34 chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. So they're almost at the end of the book. And they get to this point where it says 29, verse 9, carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. The Lord's going to bless you in this covenant on his part of it. And all all, all of you are standing in the presence of the Lord. Remember, they were standing. They were standing for the reading of the word of God. They were standing for the prayer. They were standing in confession. And now they're standing making this covenant in the same way. Um, your God, your leaders and chief men, your elders and officials, and all the other men of Israel, together with your children, your wives, and your aliens living in your camps who... who who chop wood and carry your water. Verse 12 says, uh, in, 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 here it says, and you are standing there in order to enter a covenant with the Lord your God and a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath. And I think this is what's happening. I think they're reading the Bible. I think they're getting excited about the Bible and they're, and they're saying, wait, that's what they did? That's what the children of Israel did. We need to do that. We need to follow the example that those before us have done. We want to be just like they were and full all in. I'm all in following you, Lord, just like my people before me. And I want to do it. So they, I think they've read the Bible and they want to follow the example. They want to follow the teaching in the Pentateuch. They want to follow the teaching in the law of Moses. And they say, wait, we want to be like that. We want to be an example of, uh, to others, and we want to follow the Bible and be fully committed like they are. Do you know that the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes to whom we must give an account. You see, when we read the Bible, the Bible is alive and it brings conviction to our heart. And the question then comes, when you're convicted, how will you respond? How will you and I respond when we read the word of God? When we see this is how people live, when they follow the Lord, they make a covenant and a promise. And they say, I'm all in, God. I want to follow you. I want to live for you. And that's what we see in that practice. And when the Holy Spirit puts that in us, we want to do it. But you know how we are today? 
We want to make a promise to God, but we don't always want to make it public. You know why we don't want to make it public? It's because we can be held accountable. And when we make a promise and we tell people about it, maybe you tell your accountability partner, maybe you tell your good friends, maybe you tell your spouse, maybe you tell your children, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore. Hey, my commitment is to do this. Once you tell someone, you got to follow it. You got to live it. But we, we want to make a promise to the Lord that maybe we can go back on. And so what public covenants have you made that you need to elevate in your life today? Have you made a public covenant or have you made a promise to God at some point in your life lately that you need to say, Lord, I need to get back to this. Lord, I want to trust you. or I'm I'm, I'm going to promise to read my Bible every day. And not only am I going to make that promise, I'm going to tell someone about it. So they can hold me accountable. Or maybe you're going to make a commitment. I'm going to pray every day for at least 10 minutes. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something every day as a response to, to, to serving the Lord. What are you going to do? How are you going to make that public? you got to go public. The second way we see that these Israelites are all in is this. They say, Lord, we're going to honor you in our relationships. In Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 30 and 31, it says, And we promise not to give our daughters into marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. Now it might have been that when they those when they've come back from the, the exile, that these were men. Many of them were men coming back from exile. Maybe there weren't a lot of women coming back, and they had a difficulty in finding a Jewish bride. And so when they'd come back to this part of the land, they come back to Jerusalem, Judea, into this area. And as they were looking for who is who I can who can I marry, they chose to, to marry someone outside of their faith outside of, of their ethnicity. And so in this sense, when, when they make that choice, they're, they're going after someone that's, that's, that, that the Lord had said, only choose Jewish people or those who are, are following our God, right? And maybe it was a marriage of convenience. And maybe it's possible that they had that challenge of settling for less than God's ideal because of their circumstances. You know, I talk to single people often. And sometimes their, their question or their challenge is, well, I just really can't find someone who loves God. And I feel like, well, it's a, he's a good guy or she's a good girl, but, uh, but you know, and, and he's got a good job. And, he's got, and sometimes we settle for less than God's best, less than his ideal. And if you're a single person, I really want to challenge you today to say, Lord, I only want to go for what is your best. I'm all in, Lord. In the relationship in my life, I'm not going to marry or I'm not going to even date someone who is not a believer. I'm not going to be unequally yoked. You know, in fact, that's what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not, be un, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? See, the biblical teaching on equally yoked, it's not racial. It's not cultural, it's spiritual. For for us as believers today, what matters isn't another person's ethnicity. It matters, do they love Jesus? You see, God God doesn't see the, the color of our skin or even our cultural backgrounds. What he sees is our heart. And what he wants from us and wants from a couple is when they come together, that the two of them love God together and that he is the center of their marriage. So with the Israelites, they were allowing these, these, these problems to, to separate them from God. They allowed their circumstances to become more important than pleasing God. And so for us, and here's a question I know you might be asking, well, okay, pastor, what if I'm married to an unbeliever? What if my husband or my wife isn't a Christian? Well, two scriptures I'll, I'll encourage you to look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14 and 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We might develop those a little bit more towards the end of this book, but I'm not going to go into those right now. Here's the application for this week. This week, I want you to spend some time remembering the way God has worked in your life. And you know, that's similar to what I said last week, but I want you to think about it in the context of relationships. How has God brought wonderful people into your life to show you the love of God? How has he brought wonderful people into your life that just, they pour out the love of God into you to remind you that you are loved by God, that you are cared for by God. And when we stop and think about the fact, not just the good things God has done for us in blessing us, but he's blessed us with wonderful people around us. It's easy to forget when we look on our circumstances that, 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 oh no, life is terrible. Oh, coronavirus is going to wipe out the United States. We can get that doom and gloom syndrome. But the reality is God is still faithful. 
and he is going to provide in his good timing, his good timing. So think about that this week. Third way, the third way that we see them honoring God is with their time. They say, Lord, we want to honor you with our time. When the neighboring people bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, this is verse 31, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath nor any holy day. Every seven year we are will forego working the land, and we will cancel all debts. Listen, what they're saying is, hey, when those people come in, we're not going to let, we're not going to permit the greed or the lust of other people to cause us to, from stumbling, uh, from following God. We're not going to do that. We are going to simply trust the Lord. We're not going to fall in. We're not going to buy from them, and we're not going to listen to them. We're not going to fall into that sense. You know, it's interesting. When we were just in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, and we were driving around um, the day after Shabbat. That's their, their stuff. And, and it was, we were driving down the street, and, it was, and the, the, our tour, guard, tour driver, uh, tour bus leader or whatever, she was telling us, you know, see this area over here? This is a really conservative communion community. In fact, the police have to set up these barricades so that no one drives their car through there. And we were like, well, what, what happens if they drive their car through? Well, you're not allowed to drive a car because by turning the engine, you know, you're, made, you're causing electricity to move and you're causing all these things. And that's, that's against the rules on Shabbat. You're not allowed to do that. And so do they stone them? What do they do when cars drive through? No, no, no. They do something almost worse than stoning. They throw at them dirty diapers. Could you imagine you're driving your car through this and your car gets pummeled by filled up pampers? That would be disgusting. But that's their modern way of just shaming people. And, oh, you have to clean that later? I don't think. It's a different reason to save your diapers, I guess. But uh, you're hoping for something on Shabbat. But just thinking about how, how terrible is that? They still take that very seriously today, following what the Lord has for you. And so here's our application for this. What are there ways that you are allowing others to hinder your walk from God? They're saying, we're not going to let other people come in and sell on Shabbat because we don't want them to hinder us. Is there something that happens in your life that keeps you from church, keeps you from small group, keeps you from reading your Bible, that you're allowing those things to influence you? Maybe it's time for you to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not honoring you with my time, and I need to do that. I'm letting others encroach on time that's for you. It's something to pray about. It's something for you to look at the application this week. Lord, how do I deal with that? One of the signers of the Declaration of Independence was Thomas Nelson. Yeah, you might oh, turn your Bible to the side and look at the back binding of it, I mean, and realize that there's a place called Thomas Nelson Publishers, right? Okay, so in the revolutionary time, Thomas Nelson was the governor of Virginia. Uh, he, and in October 1781, General Cornwallis marched his British troops into Yorktown. That was his hometown. Uh, the Patriots had moved south, and, and they were wreaking havoc on the Redcoat Army, and there were just uh, all these kind of attacking happening of them. And Cornwallis wanted to rendezvous, rendezvous with the British Navy in, in Chesapeake Bay. And so as they were pushing that direction, uh, the French and the American troops were anticipating and they were blockading him, stopping him. And so the, the French fleet had cut off the escape by sea. The British forces found themselves surrounded. And when they were fighting in Yorktown, they were, they were, they were gathering. And, and at this one point, he points to this beautiful home. I'll show the picture to you right here. And, and Thomas Nelson says, See that home right there? That's my home. It's the best one in town. And because of it, Lord Cornwallis has almost certainly set up his British headquarters inside. He told the American uh, artillery men, he said, open fire on my house. And as they did, the story goes that the very first cannonball shot at Mr. Nelson's house sailed right through the dining room window, landed on the table where British officers were eating. And it's one thing to say that someone's committed to, to, to fighting for freedom or someone's committed to the Declaration of Independence. It's another thing when you see someone say, hey, I am willing to sacrifice my life, my home for this freedom. You know, and, and then on October the 19th, not many days later, as the, as the British 
forces, troops were realizing they surrendered. They had nowhere they could go. Because of, of Thomas Nelson's dedication to the cause, to what he believed for America, we saw victory. And he, Thomas Nelson knew that you can't win a war unless you're all in, unless you are willing to sacrifice everything for something that's coming better later. And that's what God asked you and I today to do too. Are we willing, this is the fourth thing this morning, to honor the Lord with our blessings? You see, as we read Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 32 through 39, we see that they're willing to say, Lord, we're all in. We're willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to honor your word and to do it. And this section really shows that there's submission to God's authority, to the word of God, and really that there's an unmistakability uh, that they understand what they're getting into. We understand that when we tithe to the Lord, we give a tenth. But listen to a few of these statements here. Verse 32, we're assumed, we assume the responsibility for carrying out the commands to give a third a shekel each year for the service of the house of our God. Verse 35, it says, we also assume responsibility for bringing the house of the Lord each year, bringing to the house of the Lord the first fruits of our crops, of every tree, for it is also written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons, of our cattle, of our herds, of our flocks to the house of the Lord, to the priest to minister there. Moreover, we will bring, verse 37, to the storerooms and the house of our Lord, to the priest, the first of our ground meal, meal, our ground grain offerings, and the fruit of our trees, and the, of our new wine and our oil. We will bring a tithe of our crops. So not only are they willing to tithe, they're giving the first and the best. When we give the first and the best to the Lord, we're saying, God, I'm going to trust you to provide more in, in the future. Lord, I believe you've been faithful in the past. And I know you ask of this, and I'm going to trust you to bless me with more in the future. When they said they were all in, they trusted God for their future. And you know, it's not as easy to do sometimes. But we're not just trusting God for our future tomorrow. We're talking about trusting God for our future in eternity. And I'm asking you, do you trust in Jesus? Do you trust that he will save you from your sins? Trust that he died on the cross for you, and is he making you a new person? When we make and we enter in that new covenant with the Lord, we say, Lord, I believe you're going, to tr you're going to take care of me, not just here today and tomorrow, but for eternity. Well, have you made that promise to the Lord? Have you said to him, Lord, I want to trust you as my Savior. I want to believe that you're my Lord. Have you said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you have, I want you to come into my life and forgive me of my sins. And I want to be all in following you. I want to honor you publicly. I want to let everyone know. So have you been baptized? I want to honor you, Lord, in all of my relationships, Lord. I want to put you first, Lord. I want to honor you with my time, Lord. I, want, I don't want anything to encroach on, on, on my time with you. And Lord, I want to honor you with all of the ways you've blessed me. And I want to give a portion back to you in the way that you asked for. So I want to ask you, have you finished that way today? As we finish our time together, I'm encouraging you to pray with me as we say, Lord, I want to be all in serving you. I want you to be my Lord and my King, and I want to trust you with everything. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you work in us in ways that we can never understand. You're drawing us, Lord, to yourself. Help us to realize, Lord, that we at times will sacrifice because we don't want the, de the devil, the enemy, uh, we don't want General Cornwallis to rule in our life. We want to be Lord, we want to be, we want to be led by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So help us walk in you, live for you, and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.